Uh, sorry, I'm using the micro, uh, microphone because we are streaming, so there will be people from home following us, and hopefully it will go well. So welcome to um, this uh, end of November outside salon, um, which uh, this year, the, which this time uh, is uh, uh, featuring another collaboration. We did a collaboration in the fall with the uh, Department of Drama. Uh, this time we are doing a collaboration with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Faculty of Music, and uh, Russell will say something about it, but uh, we really thank the uh, Fields Institute for hosting us. Uh, and uh, uh, the Jackman uh, Humanities Institute for sponsoring the event. Uh, this is part of a, a three days event, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll let Russell uh, talk about it. My name is Roberta Buyani. I am the one half of Arsene Salam. The other half is uh, uh, Stephen Morris, who will be talking today. So enjoy. I assume you can hear me okay in the back? Uh, so, uh, as Roberta said, this, is, uh, this event is sponsored by the Jackman Humanities Institute. We're very pleased that uh, they allowed us to do this presentation. There are three days of events, and in addition to the two talks today, tomorrow at 12 o'clock there is a lecture concert at Walter Hall and the Faculty of Music, followed at one, at, uh, what time, uh, three o'clock by two lectures, again by Stephen Morris and Gary Kabistad, but they will be on different topics, so you're welcome to come to those lectures. It's in room 130 of the Edward Johnson Building. And then on Friday at 5 p.m., there's a concert uh, at the Faculty of Music in Walter Hall. All the events are free, so please tell your friends. So the title of our uh, symposium is Reich Rhythm and Repetition, Patterns in Music, Speech, and Science. The Reich in the title refers to composer Steve Reich, who writes what some people call pattern music or minimalist music. And in our performances, we will have we will be playing several pieces of his music, and uh, Gary Kvistad will probably refer to him at some point in his talk today. Uh, so today we'll have two talks. First is by Gary Kvistad, and second by Stephen Morris. And uh, first I'll introduce Gary. Gary Kvistad earned his Bachelor of Music from Oberlin Conservatory of Music and his Master of Music from Northern Illinois University, where he studied music, art, and physics in the pursuit of musical instrument building. In 1993, Northern Illinois University honored him with the Distinguished, Distinguished Alumnus Award. In the 1970s, Gary worked with composer-conductor Lucas Foss as a creative associate in Buffalo, New York, after which he joined the faculties of Northern Illinois and the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music. During that time, he co-founded the Black Earth Percussion Group, which recorded and toured in the U.S., Canada, Canada and Europe. He has been featured in performances with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, the Cleveland Orchestra, the Israel Philharmonic, as well as many other orchestras in North America and Europe. Gary became a member of Steve Reich and Musicians in 1980 and can be heard on the Grammy Award-winning 1998 recording of Reich's Music for 18 Musicians. And he has been a member of Nexus since 2002. <clears throat> Gary is the founder and CEO of Woodstock Percussion Incorporated, makers of Woodstock chimes and musical instruments for children. He's a 1995 winner of Ernst & Young Magazine's Entrepreneur of the Year Award for the Southern New England region and served as New York State Gale Delegate to the 1995 White House Conference on Small Business. Gary served as Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Woodstock Guild in Woodstock, New York until 2008 and as a member of the Board of Advisors of the Catskill, Catskill Center for Conservation and Development. Gary's talk today is entitled Pitch to Rhythm. Gary. Yeah. Thank you, Russell. That was quite a build-up. I hope I don't disappoint you. Uh, that's off, yeah. I'm going to start off with uh, one of my... Uh, influences uh, was this composer named Harry Parch. Uh, how many people have ever heard of Harry Parch, heard his music? Oh, that's quite a lot. That's great. Um, but in high school, I, I started reading his book and was fascinated by the beautiful instruments that he built. 
and uh, the tuning systems he talked about, the ancient Greek and Chinese systems, uh, the system of tuning that's absolutely pure, just intonation. And later in life, uh, when I founded my business in 1979, making wind chimes, uh, it was founded on uh, the desire to hear these ancient scales. Uh, so I, I built uh, metallophones out of uh, lawn chair tubes that I found in the dump and uh, tuned them up to these scales that you cannot play on the modern piano because there are notes in between the notes. And in order to really hear them the way the ancients did, you have to build your own instrument. Or at least back then you did. Uh, today you can go on the internet and hear anything and, and uh, there's all sorts of uh, apps for that sort of thing. So uh, Harry developed a tuning system that incorporated 43 tones to the octave. Uh, he never, you know, uh, used all 43 at any given time. He picked and chose the ones that he wanted to get some of these scales. And sometimes it was just one or two notes, but uh, often it was a pentatonic scale uh, or a, a small grouping. But he always had the purest sound in mind. Uh, here is uh, his scale, the ratios on the top show you the relationship from one note to the next. And uh, he called this system monophonic. It's all based on one over one. He happened to have a G tuning fork, uh, 392.01 uh, beats to the second, uh, as his basis. So his instruments are all in the key of G, basically. Uh, but he can modulate because he has all these other options here. So it's like an artist palette with lots of colors and not just 12 colors that you have to use in, uh, separately. Uh, he was able to combine these things, and he could use some very dissonant sounds, too, to his advantage. Uh, what I have here is I'll play uh, the, his line moving up, holding that low G, and then each one of these increments, uh, at 43 of them, until you land on 2 over 1, which is the octave above. By the way, I, I claim uh, scientific immunity because I'm a musician. So for the fact uh, checkers out there, if I make any mistakes, just you know, wave and correct me. I do the opposite when I'm talking to all music students, of course. So here, here is that uh, scale. you were there, the, the one right before it, but it was beating a little bit. Uh, so he was able to uh, to pick and choose, like I said. And the bottom line is the equal tempered scale on the bottom, the one that we are familiar with today. Um, and the one that we accept, even though most of those pitches are really out of tune, especially the thirds, the sixths, the seconds, the sevenths, so on. So this is uh, the guy that really influenced Parch a lot. It's a book I'm sure that all the physicists here are fam familiar with. Uh, what's really interesting is that uh, Ellis, uh, his uh, a translator, because um, uh, Helmholtz was German, uh, Ellis, I think, was a musician. And uh, he uh, registered and uh, actually uh, notated a lot of instruments in their collection from uh, around the world. And uh, also uh, talked a lot about just intonation and different pure tuning systems. So this is what we see in a music book uh, as the natural overtone series, uh, except that um, in equal temperament, the only really in tune notes are uh, the octaves. So 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16, and this is in the key of C, are the actual in tune intervals. 
Uh, the next group, uh, the fifths, are pretty close. That's why we call them perfect fifths, even though they're almost perfect fifths, and the fourths are the same. But the other notes are quite different. So I'm going to uh, play this in just intonation, and uh, all the notes are sustaining. A little hard to really hear this because of the electronics involved. There's a lot of stuff that's added uh, that is not very pure. sequence in just in uh, equal temperament. A lot more motion and activity in that. So <clears throat> I, I'm this is about the harmonic series because uh, from the harmonic series, uh, which is an infinite uh, scale, source of uh, notes, uh, we can uh, get a lot of different timbres, a lot of different pitches. Um, I built an instrument which demonstrates this, which I will show you in a while, but what's really, for me, always been very interesting, if you number the partials, uh, and the partials include the fundamental, so one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 16, here, that's the relationship of how they beat uh, in, in the air. So two is beating twice as fast as one, three is beating twice as fast as, uh, three times as fast as one, four is four times as fast, nine is nine times as fast as one, uh, four is beating four to three uh, to the adjacent notes, and so on. And then I put the ratios here that you'd find in uh, Parches scale. So uh, once again, here's a chart of the uh, of the overtones, and I'd like to play for you uh, an excerpt from a recording by Wendy Carlos. Uh, you might know her as Walter Carlos uh, from the 60s, uh, who uh, did um, Switched on Bach. Uh, it was a mind-blowing uh, recording back then, uh, and uh, he is now Wendy, and some incredible music uh, that uh, she has... Uh, recorded using just intonation. And here's her uh, little blurb about intonation. But the rest of my excitement is that not only can we have any possible timbre, but these can be in any possible tuning. At last, it's possible to leave the limits of the equal Yeah, temper. you know, for some reason, um, can we turn this up? I had asked that before. Is there any internal uh, way to, to make this louder? Does anybody know? Huh? Put the mic. Yeah, it's kind of quiet. It would be under here, but uh, I did ask. I don't want to start pushing buttons. But... <laughs> Technical difficulties. Yeah, the computer is all the way up. If it helps, it still sounds clear as well. Uh, my computer is all maxed out. All right, so. Oh, yeah? Can we go get any louder? Because this one's really quiet. Oops. But the rest of my excitement is that not only can we have any possible timbre, but these can be in any possible tuning. At last, it's possible to leave the limits of the equally tempered scale and use any form of tuning that might tickle our ears. How bad and good is our 12-note scale? Let's compare, on a basic organ stop, a sustained arpeggio, first in equal temperament.
now in perfect tuning. Here's a chord, first in equal temperament. Again, in perfect tuning. I should mention that by perfect tuning here, I mean an extended form of what traditionally has been called just intonation, but carried on up to the 13th or more partial. It's easier to hear the difference with high-pitched strings. First, two short chords in equal temperament. And in perfect tuning. Again, but longer. First equal tempered, then perfect. A perfectly tuned scale sounds similar to the natural scale on a horn. And from that, you can certainly hear where the horn riff comes from. But for older Western music, the best way to tune is mean tone intonation. With a computer, it's simple to modulate anywhere, retuning as we go, and avoid all the wolf intervals, which was the only reason we ever gave up such a good sounding scale in the first place. But the worst way to tune is probably this temperament of 13 equal steps. It's a good test of a tool's power that it can produce results as perfectly bad as that. The same tool will also allow us to write music in perfect tune or copy the scales of Bali, Java, Tibet, India, or anything else we might imagine. It's a tool whose age has truly come. I can hardly wait for the next step. There's a story attributed to Sir Ernest Rutherford, which I'm constantly reminded of. He used to say, there are only two kinds of science, physics and butterfly collecting. Thanks for allowing me to share a few of my favorite butterfly specimens with you. If you understand that one, let me know. So uh, this is my teacher, Thomas Rossing, uh, who uh, happened to be at Northern Illinois University when I was uh, in a, a group in residence there. Uh, and I made my way over to the physics department because I heard that he specialized in the acoustics of percussion instruments, which is not that common. And uh, this is the, the Bible for, as far as I'm concerned, for the acoustics of percussion instruments. Um, he was very generous, let me uh, write the introduction to uh, this book, and it's uh, got a lot of wonderful information in it, especially for those people who want to build instruments, but I think uh, for composers as well. So now I'm going to get into uh, demonstrating how rhythm and pitch are related. And uh, they're related uh, in uh, pulses. If I were to clap at this speed, this is uh, approximately an A, seven octaves below middle A. But we don't hear it because it's so slow. That's an octave higher. Now, if I can do that seven times, I'd be better than uh, uh, Buddy Rich, but I cannot play that fast. Uh, so I have uh, a program that I had commissioned uh, to be built so that I could tap these uh, uh, rhythms into uh, the computer and it speeds it up to A440. And if I do two rhythms at the same time that have a polyrhythmic relationship, this is where my wife starts falling asleep. Um, I'm trying to talk to her over dinner. Well, you know, a four over three is so cool. Um, so uh, what I uh, did to demonstrate a four over three, she doesn't even think this one's cool, but maybe you will, uh, is I have two voices. One that's saying, play the new beat, play the new beat. The other one is saying, play, cool, drum, play, cool, 
drum in the relationship is four against three which is my high school teacher taught me that by saying pass the goddamn butter and I apologize to anybody who's offended by that but so here you can actually hear it and if you concentrate on the individual lines you'll hear play the new beat or play cool drum at a slower rate but the relationship is four against three which is a perfect fourth so when I speed it up you'll hear an E and an A above that but for now let's just listen to the voices saying these words at the right relationship Play the cool new drum beat. 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 And together they say play the cool new drum beat. So here are a couple very simple polyrhythms. One to one, which is just in unison. And then uh, if I raise this hand an octave, uh, good thing I, I brought my own drum. Uh, if you double any pulse, you raise it an octave. And this is, once again, in very, very slow motion, right? And three, uh, that's an octave. Three against two is a perfect fifth. And four against three is a perfect fourth. Five against four is a major third. So those are the polyrhythms for those intervals, and every interval has its own polyrhythm. A major second is nine over eight, and a really beautiful seventh is seven over four. So I'm going to demonstrate this uh, polyrhythmic uh, device that, uh, program that I had uh, a 22-year-old write for me about 25 years ago, uh, way before uh, computers were set up to do this. You can go online and probably find things like this. But um, what I'll do is I will first tap a unison, boom, and you'll hear uh, it, the pulse go all the way up to an A440. So both my hands will be in unison for this one. But I'm going to show it to you in an editor so you can actually see it. You can see that uh, the right hand is on the top, the left hand's on the bottom, and they're in unison. So that's a one over one. Um, now I'm going to tap out a two over one. So we're going to hear the octave. And I'll do it once again in the editor so you could actually see this. Dum ba da dum bum. That looks funny. Well, let's try it. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a, a two over one. That's right. You hear the octave So happy this is working. <laughs> What's the performance without some kind of glitch, right? So now I'm going to do a, a perfect fifth. So uh, in my right hand, I'll do three for every two in my left hand. And go to the editor so you can see it again. And you can visually see bum, ba, ba, bum, bum, ba, ba, bum. And here's what it sounds like.
I take requests at this time. Nine over eleven. Nine over eleven. Oh my God, I've never heard of that one. Uh, okay, I'm going to do uh, five over four, which is uh, a major third. And then we'll go to this. You can actually see the relationship. Once again, since these ratios are small numbers, uh, it's very pure sounding, uh, and that is just intonation, and it's to demonstrate uh, uh, how rhythm and pitch are related. Um, have you ever heard anything like that before? All right. So, I like that. So... Um, I built an instrument to demonstrate the natural harmonic overtone series because uh, you can hear it with uh, instruments that are mutable, like uh, violins, but you'd have to have, uh, say, uh, 24 uh, violinists to play perfectly in tune one note in, in the range to hear that. Uh, certainly on the piano, you, you cannot hear that because the piano's tuned to equal temperament. And uh, as I think you all know, that... Uh, that we crunch uh, 12 intervals equally within an octave so that we can modulate from key to key, but it's a compromise. Uh, even the perfect fifth is two cents off from perfect, and uh, the thirds are 16 cents off, which is a pretty significant uh, error. Um, so this is the end, but I'm not done yet. Don't leave. <laughs> There are a more recent cartoon by this guy that uh, has a guy playing a bass drum uh, and then a piano player, and the bass drummer says, now when I'm playing the melody, would you play softer, please? <laughs> and it, it was an interesting cartoon because somebody knew what they were doing. They drew a bass drum with an Alan Abel stand, uh, which is, you know, for percussionists, that's a standard. Uh, but to see it in a cartoon, like from the uh, New Yorker or something, it's unbelievable. So this is an instrument I call the Vista phone. Ah, it likes to just sing out. Um, it, uh, Vista is the interior letters of my last name, which I didn't discover until a couple years ago. Can you believe that? <laughs> so um, what I did here is I uh, built an instrument based on a G, this long tube, uh, and it's a, a G below middle C, uh, even though it's very long. Um, it, uh, that's the frequency. And then uh, I have the next, uh, all the 32 partials of that fundamental. Uh, so there's 32 notes on this thing. And if you number them once again, one, two, three, four, if I'm going to use a 32, that's a relationship that each one of these is vibrating to this bottom one. Now, uh, before I play it, I just want to set you up a little bit with the fact that uh, there are some overtones to each one of these tubes. So there's a little bit of uh, 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 weirdness to it. It's not totally pure, but there are the fundamental of each one is tuned accurately in this relationship and in just intonation. Uh, what's really amazing, there's something as uh, the physicists know uh, called the difference tones, and uh, that would be uh, a sound that you hear in your ear. It's not in the air uh, when you play two or more notes together, and it's the difference between their frequencies. So if uh, something is vibrating at 500 cycles per second and something at 400 cycles per second, you will hear a 100 cycle second in your ear. And when it's in just intonation, it's really, really clear, that difference tone. And every adjacent note is going to be vibrating this one in your ear, because that's the one. So when I, when I play 13 and 12 together, you'll hear a one, uh, and that's this frequency. So as I play this, this is going to sound like it's getting louder and louder. I'm only going to hit it once. Uh, it's uh, sort of like magic here. Um, and you'll hear that. So I'm going to just play up the scale and let it ring for a while. And you're going to hear this buzzing in your ear 
uh, which is really, really cool. And um, uh, supposedly, uh, Telemann wrote flute duets with the idea that the difference tone was the continual, the basso continuo, uh, which I'd love to hear two, uh, probably it would have to be traditional uh, recorders to play that to really get that sound happening. So here is the Vista phone, and it's 20, 32 notes. Remember, I only hit these two uh, once, right? And did you hear them get louder? Or it's just, it's amazing how it's reinforced. And it might be some sympathetic vibration, but it's difference tone reinforcing it. Um, and you'll hear a little bit of beating uh, because uh, it's really hard to make tubes exactly round. Uh, they're slightly oval because of the process when they're actually made. And if they're slightly oval, you're going to get one pitch when you hit it this way and another pitch hit it that way and uh, we try to uh, make them as round as possible but it's actually it's nice to have a little bit of vibrato because that's the uh, the uh, effect that you get. but um, uh, this is the Vistaphone have you ever heard a sound like that before if you have I want to know where <laughs> oh that's a good uh, a good idea. Let, let me just start with this guy here and uh, play that. And I think you'll start hearing those low sounds. You know, you, you might get lost in the back, but I, I'm hearing it up here, man. It's, there's that note. I barely hit that and it's like singing out, right? So this is what I do at night. I just uh, <laughs> listen to this. <laughs> so uh, any questions about that or uh, thank you. Thank you. Oh! Sorry about that. I just, I thought I was stepping on a table. Is that okay? Good thing it's made out of metal. Uh oh. Yikes. What can we do? Answer questions. I'll look What is that glued on? Yeah. You don't have any with you? And buy some glue. I gotta go and record my last question. Okay. How far away are you? Anyway, oh. We have a, we All right. Have a break now. We got. We have 15 minutes. Uh, I can answer questions. Uh, <laughs> yes, please. What did what? Oh. You know, because uh, a lot of it had to do with reading about ancient scales and realizing that um, you couldn't hear these scales unless you built your own instruments, at least back in the 70s, that um, uh, 
uh, you could listen to recordings in some cases, but you know it's difficult because the electronics throw it off. I want to hear acoustic things, you know. And uh, I had read about the overtone series, and and in books like uh, for music students, they're always showing uh, the overtone series, but they black out the notes that are out of tune, uh, which they think are out of tune. They're all out of tune except for the octave, uh, to varying degrees. Uh, so I really I wanted to hear what that sounded like, and like I said, you'd have to have a whole bunch of musicians playing perfectly without vibrato uh, to, to hear that. So uh, I wanted to build this instrument. Um, I did a, a TEDx talk uh, the, earlier this spring, and this was one of the, uh, the things that I focused on, uh, talking about uh, sounds. And, uh, uh, and I, I tried to keep it as simple as possible for a lay audience, because that, that's who watches those. Um, and I hope I did that. Uh, it's, uh, it was uh, done in New Jersey, so if you Google my name and uh, Ted X, uh, and it's not X-rated Ted, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, subsidiary, it's a more regional, even though they uh, draw people from all over the place. So um, that's what I want to do. I want to hear that sound. I want to hear what different so tones really <laughs> sounded like, and um, I think it achieves that. Did you did you get a feeling for it uh, back there even? Great, great. Does that answer your question? Yeah. The uninitiated, uh, would you mind explaining what you meant by sympathetic vibration in the context you were talking about? Uh, how many here are uh, physicists or physics students? So you, you'd be better equipped to answer that question, but I think that when things are vibrating at the same speed or related, they will... Uh, excite the other thing that is related to that. So it's a sympathetic vibration. Did I, is that close enough? <laughs> well, imagine a circle. Oh, no. And you bring one of them. The other one's going to start oscillating too. I see, yeah, which, which is what I thought that would sound like. But, uh, but yeah, that explained it makes sense. Good, good. Yeah? Um, there must be um, other uh, instruments around the world that have to find other places that are also using them. Uh, that's it just like right? Western tradition? Uh, you know, it's, uh, Indian music especially. Uh, uh, idiophones. Um, you know, I, they, they tune them by ear and everybody's different. And in Indonesia, there's uh, thousands of different gamelans. Uh, and they're kind of all different, but they're close and similar and related. Uh, and they, they, uh, I've been there a couple times. I've asked this question over and over again. Uh, not only is the language different, but the actual uh, terminology is different. So it's really hard to even talk about overtones or scales or just intonation. But what I've experienced, and uh, Ellis uh, and Helmholtz talks about it a little bit, is that they tune it by ear. and. Uh, they get a sound that they want, and I think that there's got to be a lot that are really close to just intonation for sure. But uh, the uh, flute playing, uh, the violin playing in South India especially is really pure, and uh, they're definitely uh, linked into the overtones. That's why they have the string instrument, a drone that plays. Uh, uh, they lock into those uh, pitches and uh, improvise above that. Yeah, in the far back? Well, for sort of uninitiated from, from the other side. So why is it so important to have a scale, uh, sorry, to have an octave in, uh, in the tuning system? I mean, why if some two neighboring notes, their ratio of frequencies sounds harmoniously, why couldn't you just continue it ad infinity, well, until you run out of the space, and then you will have lots of notes, but the, why is it important to, to fit all these guys into, into the octave? Which seems to be the problem with all this. Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a real ongoing problem. Uh, well, uh, to kind of answer your question, I'll go back to what I've read about the Bach's uh, time, uh, where he came up with this well-tempered uh, tuning system. It's not equal temperament. Uh, it is... Uh, uh, Related uh, is somewhere in between equal temperament and just in t or mean tone temperament. Uh, so he uh, had a modified uh, tuning system so that he could play in a number of keys. And then when he got too far away from the original, he had to stop and retune his his instrument. Um, but uh, the the octave is a very well defined 
interval, and you find that all over the world. Um, but if you do go in this uh, circle of fifths, uh, you'll find in pure it never comes back to the original note ever, uh, which is a really interesting phenomenon. Uh, so in order to, I guess, make music more universal so that we could go to Japan and play on instruments that we're familiar with, uh, the uh, equal tempered scale uh, was uh, devised. And A440 uh, was determined uh, sort of as, uh, it fluctuates a little bit depending on where you are, but A440 uh, was a tuning standard uh, which was devised, as I understand, in Chicago by a, a fellow who built percussion instruments called J.C. Deegan. And uh, he uh, went to the armed service bands and uh, uh, tried to negotiate making that the standard and he was successful. So he then made these tuning forks that were used all over the world then to standardize it. But uh, uh, your specific question about the octave, could you restate that part of it? Um, that's okay, it was sort of... Uh... I answered enough. <laughs> yeah. From the thinkers, uh, so I see that your, I mean, your percussion is, is by the thinkers. But I mean, you can't imagine using any sort of material or any sort of resonating with different materials with different materials yeah uh, bamboo um, the uh, gamelan orchestras of Bali uh, uh, use a lot of different materials bronze uh, and uh, steel um, they use iron and bamboo. So they have these giant uh, uh, Gendera instruments made out of bamboo, which sound fantastic. Um, I use aluminum for a number of reasons. Uh, one is that when I was a student uh, doing my graduate work, I didn't have a lot of fun, so I'd go to the landfill, and there were piles of aluminum lawn chairs there thrown away because the webbing was broken. So I grabbed a lot of them, and they encourage you to shop there because they love to have things removed. And I cut up the uh, tubing and uh, made metallophones to experiment with these scales. Uh, and then when I started making wind chimes uh, uh, for my company, um, it worked out great because aluminum is uh, really great outdoors, and that's where most people lead their wind chimes. So uh, it'll oxidize a little bit, but uh, the tuning doesn't really change at all. So that's good. But there's different characteristics of different metals. And uh, the speed of sound is different for iron as it is for steel and aluminum and so on. So you just have to adapt to that. But uh, there's different um, uh, timbres then, too. Uh, so uh, there's, there's uh, reasons for copper sounding the way it is and aluminum. Uh, Lou Harrison, the composer, built instruments called the, that he uh, called the American Gamelon. He used uh, aluminum plates, aluminum tubes. Um, uh, he used uh, tin cans for resonators uh, and uh, beautiful, beautiful sounds. And he tuned his uh, instruments in these ancient systems as well. Uh, but uh, he mostly uh, used aluminum because uh, the resistance is good uh, and uh, the speed of sound is uh, uh, very helpful for aluminum. They, uh, it uh, rings forever or for a long time, as you can tell with this one. Yes? Uh, Russell's done a lot of work in that area, and uh, there there is a relationship. Uh, when you when you do a thing called phasing, and you were just pointing out that you start off uh, a rhythm together with another player, and then one player starts going slightly faster, and that's sort of like detuning it. Uh, so if there are two instruments in unison, and one raises its pitch, you start hearing wah, 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 and it gets faster and faster the further away they are. I think there's a similar thing there, but we're not hearing pitches with the rhythm per se. We're hearing pitches from the drums, uh, which is different. Um, so there, there's a, a relationship there. I'm not sure it's so obvious, uh, but at least uh, theoretically it's there. And I find it really interesting to think about that uh, relationship. Yeah. If you go, uh, I did an experiment a couple years ago 
at uh, Hamilton uh, Master University. They have a thing called a live lab. I just don't even know about that. But we, uh, a friend of mine and I, performed a phase, a Steve Reich's phase, on some Mongo drums. And we put transducers on each Mongo and recorded uh, the sound of each one. And you can see the results of that if you go to the website, uh, I think it's Mimble Lab slash, slash Reich. Or go to the Mimble Labs at, uh, at McMaster University. And so you can see a readout of a perfect phase where everything is, it would be theoretically exactly accurate. And then you can see next to it, and, and here, a phase that we actually did see the irregular, the irregular so that might also change a little bit. Are, are you talking about that uh, this week at all? Uh, I'll be talking about it a little bit tomorrow at uh, the noon time lecture class. And, oh, and what, what time are we doing drumming and what day? Sorry, I'm thinking about this, hoping he gets back in time. Uh, so uh, we're also, uh, then Friday, we're playing Mallet Phase uh, uh, in a concert. And tomorrow, all right, get away. Uh, we'll be playing a, another piece by Steve Reich, uh, which is originally called Piano Phase for two pianists playing patterns. Uh, I built some instruments uh, to uh, so Russell and I can play it on percussion instruments, and I tuned them to just intonation because of the uh, the intervals that come out of uh, Steve's music. Uh, it's so beautiful to hear all these different tones and uh, the uh, psychoacoustical effects uh, that uh, happen uh, when the phasings going on and different uh, halls, the sounds of different halls and so on. Uh, so uh, come and see that one. Uh, I call it Mallet Phase, uh, and we recorded it, and it's not released yet, but we will eventually. Yeah? When you were uh, creating that scale for Mallet Phase, what was it for Just like this, or did you like somehow amend and, and I, I actually uh, and had uh, materials and made uh, an instrument, actually uh, two instruments, uh, one made out of wooden bars like a big xylophone, um, and an, another instrument that's made out of the larger tubes, not the biggest ones here, uh, for uh, one of the sections. Uh, but I used the pitches that Steve called for on the piano, so they're exactly the right notes, but a very different timbre and a very different sound because of the per percussion part of it. Exactly. Uh, I, I cut them to the right. Uh, I have another program that uh, gets me very close. I, I say what pitch I want and uh, what the material and the speed of sound and all that, and it, uh, it uh, churns out the uh, cutting uh, list. Uh, and then from that, then I fine tune it. I'm dangerous up here. <laughs> yeah, one last question. Yeah. Can you just talk briefly about what makes gongs so special and intense, especially in the East? Uh, sure. Uh, by gongs, you mean the, the melodic ones that with the uh, embossed centers or the flat sheets? Or like wing gongs or fang gongs? Or... The, the, uh, the flat instruments are generally called tam-tams, and uh, the uh, instruments with a button in the middle uh, we call gongs. And uh, they have a very different effect. The ones that have the button are made to have a specific pitch. And you, uh, you'll find those in Bali and uh, Java and the gamelan orchestras that uh, are tuned to the system and the note that you want. Uh, the, the flat ones are tam-tams. And uh, they're hammered so that they have a lot of different overtones that are not necessarily uh, harmonic. Uh, they might just happen to be. So every tam-tam. Uh, uh, is really, really different, even if it's exactly the same size and all the other characteristics. So um, uh, that's uh, you know, something in a nutshell there. But uh, there are a lot of uh, people that advocate uh, healing uh, and sound therapy. Uh, and the Europeans are, I think, more advanced than at least the Americans, where I live, uh, in, in research has done. But there are a few people in the United States, uh, John Bellew, uh, has done a lot of research as to what frequencies have uh, what effect on us, and uh, and he sells tuning forks that uh, relate to those frequencies. You know, I personally wonder, since we're all very different, you know, if we take a medication, uh, so, sometimes it works 
you know, aspirin uh, gets a headache, uh, fixes a headache for some people, and it doesn't affect on another person. Uh, so I think that we all have our own frequencies of healing, and uh, you kind of have to discover that on your own. I don't think there's a prescription for uh, anything specific, uh, but sound does have an incredible impact. And tam-tams are really wonderful because they have this wide spectrum, including a very low uh, note, if it's a larger one, of course. From standard. Uh, it's been all over the place. Uh, when uh, Richard's, uh, Richard Strauss wrote his music, I think it was like 435 or something like that. And uh, so uh, it got higher and higher. I think the, uh, the singers wanted it uh, to raise up for some reason to fit vocal ranges. I don't know. Uh, but it made it really difficult for French horn players to, <laughs> to play Strauss's music even after that. Uh, but uh, there's still um, a lot of variables. Uh, uh, around the world. A442 is another uh, common one. Uh, we're going to take a break now. There's no, we don't take a break. We have some food here, and there's coffee. coffee. They just need uh, uh, some coffee. So uh, please feel free to do yourself. And, um, and, uh, you know, and we will be back, like, what, like, 20 minutes? 30 minutes? Yeah. 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 There'll be more discussion. Really Thank you, everybody.